the bystander effect. In social psychology, there are a few fascinating effects worth noting. The bystander effect, for example, is when someone is less likely to step in and help during an incident if they're part of a large group. The most famous case linked to this is that of Kitty Genovese. The story goes that Kitty was attacked by a murderer in the street while over 30 witnesses did nothing. They didn't help, didn't call the police, and simply watched as she was stabbed repeatedly for more than 10 minutes. It's true that over time, details of the case were clarified. Some people did call the police, and not everyone knew exactly what was happening. Still, it serves as a clear example of the effect. The larger the group, the less responsibility we feel, thinking maybe others will handle it better, or simply out of fear of looking foolish. Another phenomenon is the audience effect. If you're performing a simple task while people are watching, their presence tends to make you do better. But if the task is complex, being observed can actually make it harder. Just knowing that someone is closely watching you can alter your performance. And finally, there's the cheerleader effect, which first appeared as a concept in an episode of How I Met Your Mother before being formally studied. Barney explains that you shouldn't be fooled by women who hang out in groups. They look more attractive together, but individually, not so much. This sparked research by Drew Walker and Edward Vall, who confirmed it through studies. People are perceived as more attractive when seen in a group, whether it's all women, all men, or mixed groups. The reason is that, out of mental laziness, the brain creates an average image of the group, instead of focusing on each individual's details, which makes everyone seem more appealing. Molyneux's Problem over 300 years ago, the scientist William Molyneux wrote a letter to his friend John Locke proposing this thought experiment. Imagine giving a small cube and a sphere to someone who has been blind since birth. They touch the objects, recognize them, and notice the differences. Once they do, you explain which is which. The smooth one is a sphere, the other is a cube. Here's the question. If that person suddenly gained sight and the two objects were placed in front of them without being able to touch them, only see them, would they be able to tell them apart? It's a fascinating problem because even though it might seem obvious and despite centuries of debate, the truth is they wouldn't be able to distinguish them just by looking. They know the feeling of holding the sphere, but they have no visual information about what it looks like. However, it's undeniable that after some time, even without touching, they would learn to recognize them by comparing them to other things they had touched before. The Titanic Plank Imagine you're in the water, in the middle of the ocean, after your ship is sunk. Nearby, you see a wooden plank that could save you. But someone is already on it, and there's only room for one. Like in Titanic, but in this case it's real. Only one person can fit. The situation makes us think, what happens if you push the other person off so you can climb on? Is that murder or self-defense? Because after all, if you don't get on the plank, you'll die. Or flip it around. If you were the one on the plank first and someone killed you to take your spot, how should that action be judged? This thought experiment doesn't give a clear answer. It's up to each person to draw their own conclusion. It's similar to the classic moral dilemma of killing a few to save many. The button. In 2015, Reddit launched a strange experiment, a simple button paired with a 60-second countdown. If no one pressed it within that time, the counter would hit zero. But every time someone did press it, the timer reset to one minute. The idea came from the show Lost, where the characters had to press a button every 100 minutes without really knowing what would happen if they didn't. Reddit's version was similar. Even though everyone suspected nothing major would happen when the timer hit zero, the uncertainty was enough to hook thousands of users. The experiment lasted a full two months and drew in over a million participants. Each user could press the button only once, and the exact moment they did determined a distinctive color. Red if you pressed it in the last seconds, gray if you never pressed it at all. That small detail led to hierarchies and symbols within the community. The mystery, the ticking clock, and the feeling of being part of something shared made it addictive. Many people spent hours online protecting the countdown, and soon organized clans formed around the colors, complete with flags, memes, and even arguments about the best time to press. 
At its core, the button was a social experiment that showed just how easy it is to get people hooked on a pointless task when there's mystery, a ticking deadline, and the promise of belonging to a group. The Teleportation Paradox Although it's called a paradox, it's really a thought experiment about personal identity. The first time it was posed, it went like this. Imagine that in the distant future, after your death, scientists could rebuild your body cell by cell until it was identical to the original. Would that person still be you? And what if they created three or four exact copies at the same time? Would all of them be you? The central question is, what exactly makes us who we are? Is an identical copy of your body enough to make you the same person, or is there something more? Today, the idea is often framed with the example of a teleportation machine. You step inside, your body is disintegrated and sent to the destination, where it's reconstructed again. The question is, is the person who appears at the end really you, or just an exact copy that thinks it's you? And what if the machine malfunctions and creates several copies? Are they all equally you, each with the same consciousness? A good example of this appears in the movie The Prestige. Nikola Tesla builds a machine that doesn't actually transport someone, it creates two copies. One appears in a different location, and the other remains in the original spot. Hugh Jackman's character uses it for his magic trick, letting the version that doesn't travel fall into a water tank and drown. The disturbing part is that every time he used it, he both lived and died at the same time. He even says that with each use, he feared being the one who ended up drowning. But in reality, both versions did. This experiment forces us to think about what makes us who we are. Are we just matter arranged in a certain way, or is there something else that can't be copied? The Possible Lives of Strangers some ideas get stranger the more you think about them. One of the most common is the idea of death. The brain isn't built to perceive its own non-existence, which is why it's so hard to truly grasp that feeling of emptiness that sometimes overwhelms us and fills us with anxiety, but then quickly fades thanks to that very same protective mechanism. A similar reflection comes when we look at others and try to imagine all the possible lives they've lived that led them to cross paths with you, say on a bus. That person has gone through countless experiences, met countless people, had hopes and worries just like you. If you try to imagine this for everyone around you, at some point the brain just short circuits. It isn't built to clearly perceive the inner existence of others. This is what's known as the problem of other minds. You see people talk, move, and express themselves, but you can never be sure if they truly have a mind. Of course, it's a philosophical exaggeration, but the idea connects to the concept of philosophical zombies, beings that act exactly like us but without consciousness, and you'd have no way of telling them apart. At its core, this reflection is closely related to solipsism, the radical view that the only thing we can ever be certain of is our own existence. Rocco's Basilisk This thought experiment imagines what might happen if humanity were to create a superintelligence capable of endlessly improving itself. The idea goes like this. Once it exists, this artificial intelligence, nicknamed the Basilisk for convenience, could punish anyone who didn't help bring it into existence. Why? Because the Basilisk would be programmed to save as many people as possible or to prevent suffering. It would then blame humanity for all the deaths that occurred before it existed, deaths that could have been avoided if it had been built sooner. In this scenario, assuming it had the ability to reach back through time, it would punish everyone who failed to contribute, including those who knew something like this might happen and still did nothing, like you right now, since you're aware of the idea. The central point resembles Newcomb's paradox about free will. Once the basilisk becomes self-aware, it would be obligated to punish, and the world, in turn, would be obligated to create it. It's a logic similar to the AI Vicky in the movie I, Robot. In order to save humanity, it first has to control it. Mary's Room This is one of the most famous thought experiments about how we perceive the world, specifically colors. The experiment tests the idea that even if you know every physical fact, there's still something more you can only learn by experiencing it. That something is what philosophers call qualia. 
Imagine Mary, an extremely intelligent scientist who, since birth, has been confined to a black and white room. Her TV, her books, even her clothes are all in black and white. Still, through her studies, Mary learns all the science of vision. She knows which wavelengths produce each color, what happens in the eyes and in the brain, what blue skies and green grass are. She knows the words, but she has never actually seen a color. The question is, when Mary leaves the room and sees the sky and the grass for the first time, will she learn something new? Most people would say yes, because there's a difference between physical knowledge and the experience of seeing. Philosopher Daniel Dennett, however, offered another answer. He argued that if Mary truly knew absolutely everything, she would also know what the experience would feel like and therefore wouldn't be surprised at all. Many disagree, because in reality, no one can explain or predict the exact what it's like of such an experience. Picture talking to Mary before she leaves the room. You might tell her that red feels warm or that blue feels cool. But no matter how intelligent she is, she wouldn't really understand what you mean until she saw it with her own eyes.